Hello and welcome to this deeply thematic category in our April preview series for Or Shucks, a digital convention where we're demoing games on behalf of publishers that can't do it in person. Now, a quick thing before we start, these are previews, not reviews. We've just read the rules a bit to get the gist of what's going on so we can relay that information to you via video. And first up in this video, we're talking about Dialect from Thorny Games. Dialect is a role-playing game about language and how it dies. Throughout the game, you and your friends are going to be creating an isolated community who, as part of their isolation, develop their very own language that will reveal truths about themselves and their world. Now, that all sounds a little bit lofty and complicated, but don't worry, Dialect is quite straightforward. First off, when hosting a game of dialect, one player will take the role of the facilitator, guiding players through the game and making sure everyone is included. They will, of course, take part in the game itself, but their other role is to make sure that everything runs smoothly and everyone is having a good time. Now, once we've chosen a facilitator, the players will start by building their isolation. There are four phases of play in dialect, and the first is to create the isolation by picking a backdrop, aspects, and answering community questions. The backdrop will provide a larger setting for the game, and dialect provides a number of these in the back of the book straight away, and we're going to be using the outpost, a stranded Martian colony for all our examples here. And this is also where players will settle on a tone for their game. Dialect can oscillate between whimsical and silly to deeply emotional and serious, so this is a good time to settle on a tone that suits everyone. The group then answers aspect questions. These are questions that are going to continue to define the world that your characters exist in. The first two come with the backdrop. For example, what brought us together for this mission, and what about Mars defines our daily life? Alongside this, the group will create a third aspect that will make the setting entirely their own. So, with those three aspects, your world might have a backbone like so. We were brought to Mars due to massive environmental collapse, but Mars isn't much more hospitable due to the extreme radiation, which we offset by our heavy biological augmentation. Each player will then answer a community question as set by the backdrop in the book, and finally, we will name the isolation we have created, placing it on the centre of the table. We've got our world, and now we will make our characters, and each player will pick an archetype from these cards and work out how that character relates to the aspects you've chosen. A protector, for one example, might have specific heavy augmentations that help them deal with the heavy radiation in our Mars colony. That player then gives everyone round the table an introduction to their character, as well as giving them a name. First, a common name that they'll be commonly identified by, as well as a special nickname, something like a rank, or honorary title, or even just a special nickname. That is most of the setup, so once we have our characters and setting, we can play through the turn sequence that makes up most of dialect, starting with choosing a card. Each card will turn into a word that your community uses, so when you pick the card, you link it to an aspect, revealing how that word came about or why it was needed. And then begins the core of dialect, creating these words, linking this aspect to this idea collectively to come up with a new piece of dialect that your group is going to use. Now, this might sound daunting, but the book contains tons of tips to make creating a language a bit easier. Perhaps you might repurpose a word, combine two different words, blending them together. Maybe you'll clip an existing word in half and just use a bit of that as a stem. There are tons of examples in here to make that process a little more comfortable and easy, and just as well, because afterwards you're going to have a conversation using that new word. You'll choose two or more characters to have this conversation and set the scene to demonstrate their relationship to this new word. And just as well, because these conversations are primarily where you're going to be advancing the story of your game on a personal level. And of course, language will snowball between these conversations, building meaning and connections for your society, but also the characters themselves. Now this is mostly what you're going to be doing during dialect, but there are a couple of actions that will twist that formula. One of them is creating variants. At any time on your turn, you can discard a card and create a variant on an existing piece of dialect to further expand the reach of your isolation. 
Action cards represent special turns, unusual circumstances, or strange ways that language enters the group vocabulary. These might show language evolving, or proverbs being created, or the sound of the words themselves changing. Some of these will have you create a word in an entirely more literal and direct way, using roots and stems built into the appendixes in the book to create something from scratch. There's even cards in here to create words that are hyperbolic or euphemistic, fleshing out the world to new extents. Eventually, ages end and languages move forward. Once everyone has taken a turn, we read a transition prompt that marks a change in how our language is understood. There will be multiple pathways and the group will collectively decide on one, but largely at the end of the second age, an event is heralded that will cause the end of your isolation, and at the end of the third act, that event comes to pass. But most importantly, in each age, one aspect is evolved, tweaked in line with players' experiences so far, and pushed into the next ring of ages. And that is the general structure of dialect. Over the course of three ages, we will play cards, create words, and be guided by the book to create a set of characters and a setting with its own entirely unique language. And then, once each phase is played through, the legacy phase, where each player will draw a card and discuss the prompts in front of them, finally closing the book on their isolation and character. And that is Dialect, a game about a language born and then eroded. I'm really in love with the presentation and impressed by the brevity of the rules to complexities and intricacies created within the gameplay. There is a truly compelling idea driving this thing, and mechanics to back that idea up. And on a personal note, Dialect ended up being the last Orshucks preview that I filmed, and I was saving it to last because I looked at this rulebook and went, that's not a big rulebook, but it's the biggest I've looked at so far. Far from it! There is a simple core here that's very easy to understand, backed up by lovingly rendered examples and tons of illustrations, and some fascinating little bits at the end on dead languages. I was quite amazed at how this game made itself approachable and easy for people to get into, despite a potentially daunting pitch. And that is Dialect, a fascinating game all about language from Thorny Games that is available online now. Goodness me, some games you just have a good feeling about. Uh, this is Robot Quest Arena, created by James McDonald, designed by Paul Waite and Rob Doherty. This is from Wise Wizard Games, who you may know from a little deck builder called Star Realms and a slightly larger deck builder called Hero Realms. This is another deck builder of the kind of cheap and cheerful and punchy and glitzy variety. This is uh, as Robot Quest Arena, I've already said that. Look at all this bubbly art, look at this juicy, glossy, charming style this game has. What we've got here is a combination of uh, a deck builder and something closer to Robo Rally. We've got a four player game set up here. Everyone gets their own little starting deck that's mostly energy with one hammer and some jump jets, of course. And this is a game of Robot Wars. So if you've played Deck Builder before, you'll know the gist. You've got your own private deck. You're gonna draw a five card hand and then on your turn, you can spend any energy you've got in your hand to move and or buy cards. So let's imagine I'm Pug and Rhea over here. I've got four energy. I could go one, two, three, four. Uh, I could actually go one, two, three, four, because if you start your turn in this blue thing without other players pushing you out, you're gonna get a victory point. Shades of King of Tokyo here. Or I could stay here and use all four energy to buy any cards from the shop. We've got six cards here that are drawn randomly from a deck, as well as three basic cards, Advanced Battery, Heavy Hammer, and Ribbit Gun, that are always going to be available. Obviously, I want a Boomerang, because Boomerangs are absolutely awesome. That's then gonna go in my discard pile, along with all the energy I spent, and I'm gonna draw five more cards ready for the next turn, and we're gonna move on to the next player. And what players are trying to do in this is get a deck that's gonna let them cause incredible amounts of damage to their friends, either from melee or ranged combat, as you play cards that do damage, for example, let's imagine I've played my battery here, which has a range of three, so I can go one, two, three, and hit. Who's this? Who's this clown? Crate. Crate and Rolf. Uh, Rolf's robot crate. Uh, I can fire my boomerang, that's going to do two damage. Uh, and the damage that I'm taking off of crate here, that is going to go straight to me as victory points. Yes, every damage you do to someone else is a victory point. That last cube though that everyone has, that's two victory points, so getting a death blow is worth a few extra points. 
So what happens if I kill Crate entirely on my turn? Either by shooting him or hitting him with a hammer or, excitingly, pushing him into a wall or a pillar um, with my movement, which is also something you can do. Uh, that robot is removed, it's destroyed, but don't worry, that person is not eliminated from the game. This is an easygoing family fun time thing. At the start of Crate's next turn, they're just gonna come right back onto the board in any of the four corner respawns, and they're gonna keep playing. Uh, what else have I not mentioned? I've not mentioned that there are special tiles. We've got solar panels that'll give you more energy if you start your turn on them. We've got tacks that are gonna uh, do damage to robots that walk over them. We've got pillars that are going to create movement and shooting more complicated to block line of sight. Um, I've covered basically the entire game. It's really as simple as that. You can tell it's from Wise Wizard who really get to the core of uh, what systems and mechanics are fun, which we saw in Star Realms and Robot Quest Arena, which will be coming to Kickstarter soon absolutely has the same devil may care we're just gonna do <laughs> we're just gonna let you have fun and we're gonna do as few rules as possible to get in the way of that fun i think this is super cute i'm incredibly charmed by the style of this game and it, frankly all of its component parts which are robo rally robot wars and deck building i'm a big fan of i think this is neat i'm excited to see what the finished game is because of course this is a prototype Europe Divided is a two-player game about vying for control over post-Cold War Europe. One of you will play as Russia and the other as EU and NATO, both of you trying to outmaneuver and outsmart your opponents to exert your influence over the land. The game of Europe Divided is made up of 20 turns, and each turn involves an action segment and a headlines segment. In the action segment, each player plays two cards from their hands to both claim initiative and take actions. The player who has the highest sum total of cards will play their whole turn, followed by their opponent. Actions in this game are entirely driven by these cards, and each card shows a number of possible actions that you can take. Some symbols will let you place and increase these influence dice to exert control over regions. And if you manage to get that dice to a 5 or a 6, then you take control of that region and add its own card to your discard pile. Placing that dice will often cost money, and that's why on some of the cards there's an option just to take some money. This one will gain me 4 money, which I can then spend on more dice. But money can also be spent on building armies, which can be moved for another one of these actions, once for free or more for a price. And some of these cards have special actions or reactions, and knowing when to play them can swing the battle in your favour. Most of the advantage cards that players will take from seizing these regions in Central or Eastern Europe will give you these special actions, so knowing what your opponent has at their disposal and what you can use against them is key. But most of these cards will relate to the interactions between dice and armies on this board, with simple combat where pieces are removed in a one-to-one -one ratio. Complicating this are these influence dice. If they're ever at a full six, then they eliminate armies on arrival, but reduce themselves to a five in the process. And to further complicate this, the Baltic and Black Seas have their own advantage cards that allow quick movement across vast swathes of territory. And on top of that, each player gets special advantage cards that can be spent for money or a special action or kept for points. Now, once players have resolved their actions for the round, we move on to the headline phase. There'll be a constant conveyor belt of these cards throughout the entirety of the game, offering up juicy scoring opportunities for you and your opponent to seize. If the headline conditions are met by the corresponding player, then they'll gain all the awards listed on the card. But players have some control over what headlines come out when, as they start with a hand of them, so knowing that a headline might be impossible for your opponent to complete is a huge part of the game. So we'll keep going back and forth, playing action cards and headline cards and scoring criteria until we reach the halfway point, at which point we'll score for dominance. If players have six influence in a region, they'll get a little smattering of points. This happens at the end of the game as well, after 20 turns, and whoever has the most points will be the winner. And that is Europe Divided, a tense game of control, influence, and tempo for two players with this lovely snappy card-driven core. Uh, I've shown it off here with the deluxe upgrade components, these nice wooden influence markers and influence dice, as well as these metal coins. So if that takes your fancy, then this one is available from Phalanx Games. Up next, we have a game that's gonna put the sand in your sandbox. Uh, sand meaning like grit, like Wild West kind of toughness. Uh, this is Bantam West, put out by 
Bantam Planet. I knew I was that was a memorable publisher. Um, and what we have here is a Wild West uh, extravaganza that is going to be familiar to people who might have played Matago's uh, recent game, Western Legends. But honestly, unboxing it and setting up all these lovely little components reminded me of um, when I was unboxing big boxes just bursting with stuff like Fantasy Flight's Imperial Assault. Um, but where Imperial Assault was largely cooperative, um, what we have here is something very, very competitive. This game's mean. Um, this is a Wild West game. What I have set up here is the simple game, the kind of introductory game uh, using the field manual, but there's a whole um, advanced manual full of advanced concepts that I'll get to later. This is just the learning game. We have a two-player game here. We have Jericho Jones, the merchant, versus Hannah Wild, the arsonist. Which, I, I mean, I wasn't paying attention, but I've seen arson in like several Wild West games. It's becoming a character trait, and that's fine. I've got nothing against arsonists, personally. Um, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, <laughs> Quince, focus. This is a game about hitting five notoriety, okay? Um, everyone's gonna have a little checklist of ways they can gain notoriety. In the advanced game, you're gonna have way more, also some character class specific stuff. But in this basic game, we have an excellent Wild West to-do list. Kill an enemy, buy a horse, build a cabin, purchase a legendary item, and master an endeavor. Well, yes. So at the start of the game, um, we've got our two characters in town here, and then we have two boards known as Half Acre Boards. Uh, in the introductory game, we got a forest and some wetlands. And, well, um, I'll describe the sort of... Surprising no one, you can shoot and kill one another, you can go to the general store and spend money on guns and then go after your friends with a shotgun, and you can actually burn their cabins down. Um, but uh, to begin with, uh, you're probably going to be focusing on uh, just getting out there and doing some logging and foraging. Generally speaking, in Bantam West there are going to be different sort of areas of wilderness that you can go to to practice different things, like including in the advanced game trapping and mining. But in this basic game we've got logging and foraging, so uh, the turn structure is pretty simple. On your turn, you use one of several action tokens to take an action, which might be moving from one board over to another board, and then moving from that board and doing another action. Well, I mean, actually, we've got some bears and some bandits that you're going to want to try and defeat. Um, but once the board is cleared, you'll be able to make some money um, by, for example, logging and foraging. Uh, then you can go back to town and sell stuff at the general store. You can use your money to buy all kinds of fancy weaponry or a mount that's going to let you move faster. You're probably getting the vibe of what kind of game this is now. Um, but what really tickled me is there's just a little dash of Eurogame in here, okay? Because what you can do um, is actually set up a little engine, as Frontiersmen would have in these times. Um, you can go and spend money collecting a blueprint for a cabin, and then you can, if you trek off into the wilderness with your cabin blueprint and enough lumber, you can then set up a little cabin in the woods. And that cabin is going to be occupied by homesteaders who, well, I don't, know if, I don't know if homestead is the right word, I'm English, uh, the wild west of England is Cornwall, and frankly, it's not wild at all. Um, but once you have a cabin, over time, that cabin is going to gradually fill up with resources unique to that board. So if uh, Jericho here were to set up a cabin in the wetlands over here, that means it's going to acquire these kind of wetland uh, forage tokens. Um, and they are gonna go into my adorable little cabin blueprint. Uh, now, these numbers you're seeing on my cabin blueprint, those represent skill checks, and you'll notice one of the skill checks is just like a fire symbol. That's because, um, well, uh, the cabins that you built, you might sort of be inclined to build one of these cabins quite close to the entrance of a map board so that you can go and collect resources from it easier. That could, I mean, depends what kind of friends you're playing with, because your friends can, by visiting your cabin, if you're not around, or if you're just next door and they're feeling like chances, they can go into that cabin, they can steal your stuff if they acquire devices to break into it, or they can set it on fire. This is where your arsonist comes in. But any, everybody in Bantam West can get in on the arson. <laughs> Uh, they can set fire to your cabin, and then it's up to you to try and burn it, I mean, quench the fire fast enough. Uh, players can also hide in one another's cabins. In the advanced game on the mountain board, you in fact have to overnight in a cabin, otherwise you're going to get frostbite. And players can break into one another's cabins just to shelter there, um, which I thought was really thematic, really quite cute. Um, but that's, uh, oh, I should also describe how combat works. Combat in this game is pretty neat. Whether you're taking on an NPC or another player, um, combat works the same, and you'll see these colored rings uh, all relate to line of sight. You might have seen this system in games like Tannhauser or Unmatched. 
Um, all the colored rings mean is that same colors can see one another. So if you're in a pink colored ring here, and I'm in a pink colored ring here, and excitingly you'll notice nothing stops you from having fights with other players right in the town where all the shops are. In fact, that's actually a pretty convenient place to have a fight because it's where the jail and the doctors is. Um, but if players are in light colored rings, that means they can see each other and one player can start a fight. At that point, you're both going to grab your combat decks and you're going to play a game involving a little bit of hand management because players are going to take turns to choose a card and then reveal it at the same time. And I'm, I'm referencing lots of other board games in this uh, in this preview um, in, a, in a manner that you may remember from Fury of Dracula um, cards might cancel one another out. So if you go to tackle someone, that's going to be great if they were blocking. The attacker will then resolve their card first, hopefully doing a bit of damage, and then the defender will resolve. And then you'll go again, but you won't pick that card up. So you're choosing your next combat card from a diminishing hand of actions, which is a mechanic I really, really like. This will continue until someone has moved out of line of sight, or one of you has just collapsed. If the attacker is the one who uh, ends up having their vitality go down to zero, the attacker then goes to the jail, which I'm reading this upside down, is, oh, the jail and the doctor is one building. That's, that's very convenient, again. Um, if the attacker uh, fails the fight and collapses, they go to jail. But if the defender goes to fight, go, uh, loses the fight, then they go to the doctor. But whoever loses the fight, they're gonna get robbed by the other player. You have a sort of shopping list of things you can take, uh, like their guns or their money or any resources they have. Um, and that's extra good, obviously, because not only do you have more resources, but you took them from your opponent. That's, uh, that's lovely stuff. But um, what you can see on the table, this is a <laughs> sprawling array of stuff. This is just the beginning of your uh, Bantam West experience. Um, if we have a look through, ah, 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 just ripped some, I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, in the advanced manual, uh, you're going to see a whole load of new advanced mechanics. You can recruit locals to act as riders, who bring their own unique skills to your posse, but also give you a last stand ability, which triggers whenever you would collapse. Your riders can also permanently die, which sends them to the graveyard board. And as I mentioned before, you'll also have two new skills of mining and collecting hides. I'm happy to see a game like this, honestly. It feels like in recent years, maybe in the last five years, the industry as a whole has slightly moved away from the simulationist thematic boxes full of stuff and adventure and components that we saw a lot of back in like, you know, 2005 to 2011. Um, it's nice to see that some people still just want to tell a sort of rootin' tootin' good story with a lot of players shooting one another. Uh, I approve. Let's see what the next game is. Hello, I've come to interrupt this preview video to bring you Bits and Bobs. Do you need bits for your board games? Well, don't worry, because Draw Lab Entertainment have got you covered. They've got bits coming out of their... Bit Factory. Bags? they got bags. Coins? they got coins. Boom! You've got your copy of Abandon All Artichokes. It doesn't have coins, but you want to add them. And now you can, in stunning Cthulhu or tree flavour. Have they got weight? Yeah. Can you stack them? Yes, you can. Are they made of metal? Yes, they are. And that is coins. Just don't put them in your mouth because then the lovely patterns will rub off. Just look at these lovely patterns etched into these coins by tiny coin-sized people no bigger than your fingernails. But what if I want to keep my coins inside of a bag? Well, don't worry. They've got you covered there too. These svelte, cushioned game piece bags can hold whatever game pieces you could possibly need them to hold. I've got mine in two flavours. Dragon bag or dragon bag in a bag. These are soft to the touch, they've got bold colours and they're lovely on the inside too and bigger than you'd expect. You can fit three people inside this bag. And that is the end of this preview announcement. If you want luxury metal coins and luxury velvety bags, then look no further than Draw Lab Entertainment. They've got you covered with these products that you can buy online right now. Fired Up is a futuristic arena combat game, but one where you and your friends do not play the fighters in the battleground, but instead the crowd watching on. During the game, you're going to roll these influence dice to try and manipulate the fighters to your will, and trying to score these highlight cards you've got in your hands, creating great highlights 
for the fans at home. At the end of just four rounds, there will be one fighter standing, and the player who has got their way the most and earned the most points will win. At the start of each game, we lay out these fighters in the middle circle, assigning them all a speed value. Then each player takes a big chunky hand of these purple influence dice, as well as some highlight cards. These are the objectives they want to score during the game. And as well as this, they'll take their own personal hand of fighter cards they can use to place bets on the outcome of the battle. The game is played over four rounds, and each of those four rounds is made up of two simple phases. The first one is the influence phase, where players will roll these dice and use them to manipulate the fighters to set up these highlight cards to score points. We'll get to those a little later. And then the second phase is the battle itself, where we roll these dice to resolve combats between each of the fighters as they duke it out in the arena. At the start of each influence phase, each player will pick two highlight cards that they're going to score or try and score this round. I've gone for Unexpected Strike, which means the fighter with the lowest damage needs to deal one wound, and Parry, which just means that I need to get two dice to be blocked this round. Once you've chosen the two that you're going to score, you then take up your hand of influence dice, and in turn, players roll this hand. You get one opportunity to re-roll, and once you've done that, you can choose any of these dice to activate on one of the fighters around the table. Now what do these dice do? We're going to go over that in detail now. This face of the die is a buff, which lets you move up the corresponding symbol on that fighter's track, meaning they can get higher attack or higher defense. This dice is the morale dice. You place it on these slots here and morale will change in that direction at the start of the battle. The target dice lets you change a fighter's target or lock in that target. The social dice is where things get interesting. Spending two of those will allow you to take any dice action that you want, which is very useful, or you can store those social actions for later, taking this symbol and putting it in front of you to spend at a later date. But their most interesting implication is betting. If you spend one of these symbols, you can place a bet on this board over here. For example, I might think that Rexus is going to be the first fighter eliminated from the game in round one. And if I get that right in the betting phase later on, I'll score a little juicy crop of points, which is pretty interesting. The last face of these dice is the double action, which lets you duplicate any action you would already be taking. A double social, a double buff, a double morale check, the choice is yours. Once players have collectively exhausted their individual dice pools, we move on to the battle phase, where things get bloody. The first thing you'll do is check each fighter's board for a balance of thumbs up and thumbs down. If they are equal, then nothing happens, but if there is an imbalance, then their morale marker moves towards that side. And this does something pretty juicy. The markers corresponding to defense and attack for that round will slide into the highest space in that row, which can be pretty damaging or incredibly useful if you want to boost or lower a certain fighter's stats. Once we've checked everyone's morale, it's on to the fighting itself, but before we get there, I should explain height. Highlights. Each player is going to get a couple of these and they're going to choose them at the start of the influence phase and it will show you when you want these things to be achieved. If it says fight, that's during the fight itself. As soon as the prerequisites happen, you can play that card and score some points. Other cards, however, will have multiple objectives on them, which means when you choose to activate them, it's a bit of a push your luck game. This card, for example, requires two dice to be blocked but you could wait and hope that three dice are gonna be blocked for more points, but you risk that not happening later in the round. So when you play these, is pretty juicy. There are also highlight cards that trigger at the start and ends of the fight, as well as cards that require multiple little different unique prerequisites to score, which is quite exciting. So everyone's got different highlights they want to achieve during the round, which is gonna affect the little mini game over here of changing each fighter's stats. Once all that's done, it is time to have the fight itself, where we will look in speed order and resolve each fight as it happens. Marrow is the fastest fighter on the table. He's gonna go first, and he's pointing at Rexus over here. So Marrow will take equivalent to his attack value, four in red dice, placing them here, and Rexus will take an equivalent in his defense dice. He has also got a stat of four, whoop, placing them over here. 
Then we will roll these two fighters against each other like so. You'll then match up any symbols on these dice to work out which body parts are being hit. Here we can see that there has been one red head attack to two blue head defenses, which means that damage will be dealt. If ever there's an imbalance, damage gets dealt. If defense is higher than attack, the attacker takes counterattack damage, one for everything over. And then if there's an imbalance in the other direction, with attack and no defense, then the defender, of course, takes damage. They'll take two stamina damage here from these two chest hits. And if multiple hits are dealt to the same body part, that attacker will also take a wound. If you ever completely run out of stamina or take wounds up to the value you are permitted to on that fighter, that fighter is eliminated from the game. These eliminations might also trigger bets to go off. So if Rexus was the first to die, remember, we betted for him in the first round, so we would score a bunch of points. And as well as that, if any other players bet on top of us, they would score lower based on this ranking system here. So it pays to be the early bird. And that is basically all of Fired Up. There's a couple things I didn't explain, like how each of these fighters have their own special abilities, as well as there being another fighter in the box, so you'll never have the same roster twice. But at its core, it's a fairly simple game of chucking these big, chunky dice and trying to manipulate these fighters to your ends without people getting in the way, so you can score lots of big, juicy highlights. There's a lot of risk management in this thing that I was surprised by, and pushing your luck mechanics with a kind of solid, beat em up core. So that is Fired Up from Draw Lab Entertainment, seats between two and five players. Up next, we are looking at a, a digital implementation of a role-playing game known as Atma. And in fact, I am joined by Tom Brewster. Hello, Hello Tom. Quentin. How's it going? It's, it's going fine. I'm ready to look at some cards in the digital space. Yes, you will. So if I just tab over now to uh, to the Atma Kickstarter, you'll see that what this is in, in, in the physical world is a box that is absolutely packed full of cards. Cards which are going to help, uh, in this case, me and Tom, to tell a story. Um, this is, uh, from start to finish, just trying to make the act of role-playing and creativity as easy as possible with tons and tons and tons of cards which are going to act as prompts so you tell unique stories every time. So, Tom, as I understand it, if we scroll down to the page here, you've chosen to play Maud the Doctor. I am Maud the Doctor with her lovely blue hair. Uh, yes, and if we zoom in here, we can see a couple of things about more that I really like. Um, when you braid your hair, you get to do a roll um, and cut plus calm. Ooh. And on a seven plus, you can weave a rope, lasso, or a garment. Oh. And also, I love this detail. You have a purse filled with surgery supplies and candy. Uh, Maud <laughs> sounds like uh, she's a relaxing person to be around. Uh, but Tom, if you look here on this card next to you, uh, you have your first move unlocked. So this is Chasing the Truth. This is kind of like your skill. If you've played um, games like Powered by the Apocalypse games, um, which is a term meaning games inspired by Apocalypse World, uh, they all use this system that's used by Atma. Um, you, you will have what's known as a move. And when you, in the case of Maud, chase the truth... Um, it, as it says here, you are fascinated by mysteries and the fame earned from solving them. Uh, you can ask the GM for a prop uh, or extra, which is a sort of character, and set it aside and theorize how it's connected to the story. Uh, take plus one to rolls which test this theory. Um, so, Powered by the Apocalypse uh, games tend to give players real flexibility when using their move to do very, very cool stuff. Um, but, Tom, are you still with me? I'm still with you. I understand you moving. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, you've got some basic moves here as well. Um, if you, uh, I believe, yeah, Ooh. flip over your stat reference at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can rumble, you can barrage, you can realize, coerce, and survive. Uh, it's a which, colorful uh, list of, uh, of verbs there. I like that. I, I like verbs. Verbs are good. Um, <laughs> so the default moves should broadly cover everything you're going to do in your uh, sci-fi adventure with me. Um, but you'll notice, uh, just to the right of Chasing the Truth, Mm. You have two other cards there. You have yet another basic move that's yet to be unlocked, and as well as a super move. Um, you'll flip those over and find out more about them later. But for now, um, they're just providing a bit of backstory. And actually, Maud has a whole load of cards. And so, in the same way that, as we're going to see in a second, I've shuffled up some scenes and props and locations to tell a story, we've shuffled up some cards to determine who Maud is in this game. So Maud 
uh, if get, get your head around this, is more like an archetype mm. with a specific name. And if we were to play again with Maud, you would have a different backstory and different moves. But uh, let's just my Maud has moment. multitudes. Your contain your Maud contains multitudes. And if we give this a flip, uh, you are going to unlock. Uh, if we if you don't completely uh, screw the pooch on this, you'll unlock the bedside manner move and your super move overflow uh, i'm gonna zoom in on this ordinarily this would be a fun reveal later on in the adventure but overflow a massive well of bioenergy has built up in your cells the next time you collapse <laughs> release a pulse that heals or deals one harm to everything in sight but that is for later um so that's your character and see with just four cards here drawn randomly um i've got a kind of pretty fleshed out idea of who Maud is uh, now let's just scroll up and see what cards i've got as the games master so um, if we flip these cards over, uh, we have been dealt a backdrop and a story. So uh, if I flip this back over, the Tai Wu rig, um, I won't read this all out loud, but it's basically a kind of oil rig that's built over a maelstrom. Uh, and below that maelstrom is a city. Um, and uh, let's let's read this out loud. The scientists examined Atma's effects on seawater, gravity, and even the newborn ghosts who coalesce within the storm. Um, so that's a that's an evocative place to set a story. And if we zoom in on the caretaker here, this is the story we're going to be telling in this completely random distribution. You have been sent here to try and take care of um, the AI uh, that exists on this oil rig, and your goal, written at the bottom here, is to detach Guanli's sanctuary. Uh, which is the kind of uh, safe place the AI has built for itself. So you're here to rescue the AI. But if I click, you can't see this, Tom, so you'll just have to use your mind. But if I click on this button on the bottom right to go to my collection, you can see here within the Taiwu rig backdrop, I've got five different stories we could be playing. I've got pots of different scenes and extras and props and twists, all of which I can incorporate. Um, so I think you would have to really struggle to have two games of Atma that play uh, more or less the same. And I can just click here to go back to the table. So um, I really can't overstate how how easy the structure of this is. We've got th the, the entire adventure, which shouldn't take more than two hours, is played out using three random scenes. And again, I'll spoil this for the people at home. The first scene is going to be in the living quarters, which give us just um, some prompts and some fun stuff that, uh, that we could play with here. Then, in, if we flip this card, uh, the second scene in our story will be set in the Shinsheng core, and the third scene, the finale, when Maud will have unlocked her special ability. Ooh, a Maud hunt boat. Let's zoom in on this. The Ulanga Armada's hunt boats have AI captains, deck-mounted harpoons. Um, I got and, excited um, when you said a Maud hunt boat, but it's Maud uh, like that, not like Maud me. Oh, well, I mean, hey, Tom, in the world of role-playing games, <laughs> we are only limited by our imagination. But I'm just going to show one more thing. So as you roll dice... Um, and I, I don't actually have a button to roll dice. I believe only you do that. Oh, the GM. shall I click it? Yeah, see what happens. Oh, oh, there's lots of different things here, Quinns. I've got a dice in the middle. It's got a three, and I'm rolling it. Oh, hey, Tom succeeded with a roll of three and a six <laughs> and a nine, and I earned a token. Okay, this is great. So um, as you do moves uh, in order to achieve stuff within these scenes that we've created, you're giving me tokens, and if I click the spend tokens button here, uh, you can see, oh, I can spend tokens to play an extra, a prop, a twist. I can deal harm. Um, and all of these see me rummaging through decks of cards. So, ooh, I've, I've chosen to play a twist. Mm, oh, let's absolutely play this. So every time that you roll dice, whether you succeed or fail, I get tokens that I can spend to juice this story up a bit. And, of course, I've chosen the Tsunami card. Uh, if you couldn't see the sky before, you can now. The first wave tears walls and water aside like paper. Uh, you might discover that the scene is exposed to the raging sea, debris crushes everything in its past, or a third wave towers overhead. So that has hopefully given you a, a rough example of um, of what Atma is, a game that uses art and cards and decks and, uh, and a lot of randomization so that uh, while a lot of imagination is involved... Nowhere near as much imagination is involved as as, as in other role playing games because the cards are almost like panels of a comic book that we can sort of jigsaw together to tell any story we want. I've accidentally backed out of all the cards, so we should we should stop this preview here. Uh, thank you very much for your help, Tom. <laughs> thank you very much for teaching me all about Atma Quins. Thanks. Good goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> In a country, there is oil. And you, the benevolent oil company, want to help everyone out by making yourself loads of money. This is peak oil. 
Profiteer, a game about money and money. And during this game, you're going to be drilling for oil, you're going to be dealing with these local factions, and you're going to be doing your best to try and screw over your competitors. And now to keep your whole gig nice and comfortable, you're also going to be wanting to sell weapons to these people who live in this country and trying to keep the corruption levels nice and high, but not too high because that will cause the game to end and you don't want that to happen. Now, it's important to mention that this game is effectively zooming in on the oil regions in the designer's other game, Peak Oil, uh, examining the implications of taking the drill for oil and selling for oil actions in those games. It's, it's a bigger version of those actions. Uh, so with that in mind, let's learn how to play. This is the main board and we've got a country split into regions that are separated by numbers on dice. These regions will contain oil fields and these oil fields are connected to the coast, to harbours. We've also got regions where the various factions of the game are going to start, the National Liberation Front, the government, and the URFMF. And these are places where selling these weapons to these factions is going to be lucrative. You can see along the side here, we have these faction tracks that are setting the prices for bribing, selling weapons, gaining drilling rights, and selling oil. And we've also got a corruption tracker along here, which is effectively a round marker for the game. Now we'll quickly take a look at the cards in the game. Uh, first off, we have these cards up here, these event cards, which are going to flip each round. Uh, and we have blackmail cards down here that we can use to bribe the leaders, these various leader poker tokens. <laughs> poker tokens, poker chips. But most importantly, we have our five action cards here, which will show us all the different actions that we can take in the game. We'll play one of those each round uh, to take the corresponding action. Before we get into the game properly, I want to talk about these leaders. Uh, each faction, not player, has a political, military, and religious leader. And whoever owns these leaders will be able to sell them weapons or buy drilling rights from them. And each leader has their own unique power. The political leader gives you free drilling rights. The military leader lets you intercept oil. And the religious leader will let you take control of the other leaders in the faction without needing blackmail. And how do you get these leaders? mostly through blackmail. Uh, at the start of your turn, you can spend one of your blackmail cards to grab that leader. Uh, and if they're from the supply, that's fine. But if they're from another player, that player can play a matching card to stop you from grabbing the leader. They'll keep control. Now we've explained all of that, we can move on to the game itself. So during the game, we're going to play a number of rounds, and each round will flip an event, choose an action, and then resolve actions. And if corruption ever gets to 100%, then the game is over. And how might that happen? Well, in the first step, when we flip a card, if it's an event, we will increase the corruption as well as change the rules for a current round, potentially. Uh, if it's a consultant, the other kind of card in this deck, like this, then nothing will happen, but they will stick around to be hired a bit later on. So once we've done that, each player will pick one action card from their hand and play it face down. And then we will call for the actions one to five in that order. We'll go over what all those do in just a second, but note if there are any ties between actions, then which company gets to go first is shown by this on the back of the card, which shuffles around, oop, shuffles around each round. And if, as a result of this, a player can't take their action, then they will replace it with a contingency action instead, the number five, the last action. So let's go over these actions. Action one is networking, which is effectively a euphemism for digging up dirt and bribing officials. This will get you blackmail cards, and it will also give you the opportunity to bribe a leader, paying money to bribe them, shown on this track here. So at the start, very cheap to bribe any of these leaders. You'll pay the money that you're putting towards that bribe to the player that currently owns that leader, or you will pay half of that money if the leader is currently not owned by any player at all. Action two is selling weapons. Uh, you'll pick a faction that has troops still on its track, and you'll take money equal to the rightmost cube along that track. So eight money for selling to the URFMF, and that will get lower as these troops are deployed onto the board, because as soon as you sell that faction weapons, you will get to place one of their troops onto a space that that faction controls. If you place it on one of these spaces, so if this red faction controlled this space, you'd get an extra $2 for selling them some guns. Regardless of where you place them, once you have placed a cube, you will then roll a dice, and the cube will move in that direction. So we've rolled a 5 here, so the cube will move this way, because the 5 is shown up here, into this region over here. Now, if two pieces ever meet, they are destroyed in a 1 to 1 ratio. That is war. Pieces are removed at 1 to 1 ratio, because in war, everyone loses, unless war is your business. Uh, here's the thing. 
troops on the board means that a faction will be stronger. You can see as we decrease this number of troops, it'll change the prices of everything they're offering. Uh, it means that they'll give you less money for weapons. Now they've already got troops on the board. They'll be more demanding for drilling rights and bribes. Um, and you'll get less money when you use their ports to export oil. So this action is super important for manipulating the board state in many ways, which you'll see come into play later. Action three is to buy drilling rights. This is where you pick a space that a faction has control of. You pay them the current price for drilling rights. So it would be uh, $4 here to buy this space off red. And you will then place your player pawn onto that space to show that you own rights to drill in that space. There can only be one player in any region at a time, and the only way you can buy out a region is if the player currently there does not have a leader of that faction. So purple would need a red leader to make sure that they keep control of this. If they didn't, then someone else could sneak in and get drilling rights for that place and boot them off by buying them out. Action four is to sell oil, and this is where you choose a region where you have drilling rights and then pick a port that's connected to it. And that will allow you to use up your right to drill to make some money. Now, when you do this, you must consult the track over here to see how much that faction is going to let you sell oil for. So the red faction, uh, we can sell oil at 35. So we'll get 35 bucks for that sale, which is pretty huge. But obviously, they're more fragile than other factions because they've only got two troops on the board at the moment. But importantly, if those regions are uncontrolled, if nothing was there, then you'll only ever get the default price of 15 for selling oil. And on top of that, this is where the military leader comes into play. So yellow is selling oil from this oil rig up here down to this port here. And all of that is red territory. And purple has control of the red military leader. If this was the situation, then red would get 10 money off of yellow for the privilege of selling oil through a red port, which is pretty huge. The very last action you can take is contingency. And if the top card of this event pile, so if this was currently a consultant, you would get that consultant and you'd get some powers, which is pretty neat. Uh, and if it's event, you would follow the text on the event. It's nice and simple. There are tons of special bonuses from these cards. I won't go over all of them, but it's nice to know that they are there. And thus concludes a pretty speedy teach for peak Oil. The game will end if corruption ever reaches 100% and whoever has the most money at the end is going to win. Uh, there's some bitey political moving and shaking here and some brutal capitalist leanings. So if you're into mean games of selling oil and being an awful, awful business boy, uh, then check out Peak Oil Petroleum Profiteer from Two Tomatoes Games. It is available here in Tabletopia or physically in a box with real life poker tokens. <laughs>